Pastor Brad Cruz. I'd love for you to get up on your feet and give the very best welcome you can to our, our friend and pastor, Brad Cruz. Thanks, brother. Listen, I apologize about the, uh, the computer there. This is my, my I'm, I'm kind of old school. I like using paper, but Pastor Jeff preaches off of a, uh, off of a Mac. I think it looks cool, so bear with me tonight if, uh, if I have some technical issues. I'm just, I'm trying something new and I feel safe here. So, hey, it's an honor to be here with you tonight. Um, like Pastor Jeff said, I'm, I'm one of the pastors here at, at Anchor Church, and my journey here is uh, somewhat unique, and we're going to get into that a little bit more. But before we even get started tonight, I just wanted to, to take a second and, and express some gratitude and honor our senior pastor here at Anchor Church. Can we put our hands together for, for Pastor Jeff? Listen, you know, the Bible talks about being, we're all going to be responsible for what we do with this. As teachers, it says there's even a greater responsibility with what you do with the knowledge that you teach. And as a senior pastor, he's going to be judged even more strictly than the rest of us. And so I just want to pray a, a prayer over him right now tonight. And also Sarah. I'm kind of glad she's not here because she would be really embarrassed. Um, but, you know... If anyone knows Sarah Jenkins, you know to a person about her gentleness and her kindness. And, and no matter who you talk to, that always comes up. And so while Pastor Jeff is up here and, man, he's fiery and he's preaching and he's, he's drawing people and he's going to breakfast every week or just about every day and lunches and, and he's doing all these things, there's somebody back home who's allowing the atmosphere with their children and, and everything else for, for Pastor Jeff to be able to lead and shepherd like he does, and that's Sarah. So can we put our hands together for Sarah Jenkins? She, she hopefully will listen to this later in the week, and, and Sarah, we love you, we honor you, we thank you for your leadership here at Anchor Church as well. Right now, let's just pray for Pastor Jeff. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you for, for Pastor Jeff Jenkins, for the journey of his life from his birth into this day in, in October of 2020. God, you are constantly and continually equipping him to lead well, to pastor well. Father, I pray just for a freshness and a newness to restore his soul this very moment. God, fill him with your presence. Thank you. We honor him tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, we're going to spend a lot of time in Acts chapter 9. And we're going to talk a lot about the journey of life. The journey of life. In Acts chapter 9, we see Saul, who later we know became Paul, the apostle, who wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. The guy was kind of important. And in Acts chapter 9, he has an experience we're going to look at. But in Acts chapter 7, just, just two chapters before, the same Saul was there, and the Bible describes the stoning death of one of the early disciples named Stephen. And Paul was there, Saul was there giving his approval. He was, like, people were picking up rocks, and they were like, man, I can't throw this thing because of my cloak or whatever. He said, here, hand me your, hand me your jacket. He was, he was holding the jackets for the people who were stoning Stephen. So that was in Acts chapter 7. When we get to Acts chapter 9, let's take a look at what's going on. We're going to begin in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord. Remember, two chapters before, he was, he was punishing them. He approached the high priest and requested letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that, he found, so that if he found any man or woman belonging to the way, which is what they called Christians, he could bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As Saul neared to Damascus on his journey... Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. 
The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see a thing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and he did not eat or drink anything. Tonight I'm going to share a message with you that I call just forward. Just a simple one word, forward. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, I pray that in these next few minutes of of our time together, that you would minister in a special, unique way to each person in this room. God, I pray that although it may be my voice they hear in their, hear, in their ears, it would be your voice they hear in their heart. Do a unique, special work in each one of us. Draw us to you, Holy Spirit. May I make myself less so that you can be more. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you heard that life is a journey? Everybody, you know, that's a common, common theology, common thought that, that life is a journey. And, and we typically equate a, a journey to some sort of path, right? Some sort of highway, some sort of, 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 of pathway that gets us from where we're going to, or from where we were to where, we're, where, we were, where we're going. And all of our journeys have a, have a beginning date. That's the date we were born. They have an end date. You know what date that is. And what happens in between is what we call life. Life. Life happens is what happens from the beginning to the end. And the Bible describes a couple of these, uh, this journey, these pathways in a couple of different places. But before we look at those, I want to bring up, a, there was a, an American psychologist, his name was Abraham Maslow. Many, many of you maybe are familiar with him. He has this hierarchy of needs. And he, he said at one point, he said, in any given moment, we have two options, to step forward into growth or to step back into safety. And while I'm not a PhD psychologist and I certainly don't have near as much credibility as he did, I think he missed a third option. So while it's true that on our journey in life, that on our pathway in life, we certainly can step forward or we can step back, there's something else we can do, and that's nothing. We can freeze. We cannot step forward into growth, back into safety. We just freeze. We call it sometimes what? Deer in the headlights. We've all experienced it. And it's a paralysis. And many of us are suffering and, and, and living in, in that type of moment right now. In Proverbs chapter 3, we find the words, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Everybody say paths. And again, in Isaiah 43, we see the prophet Isaiah, he's, he's talking to, to the Israelites and he's prophesying to them about their future. And, and he reminds them of things that, that God had done for them in the past. And then he gets to ver, uh, chapter 43, verse 18, and he says, but forget all of that. Forget all of that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wastelands. So there's two different, two different examples, and there's many more, where the Bible is talking about this journey, this pathway that's before each of us, that requires movement one way or the other. And I, want, I would like for you to do something, just everybody, just, it's not going to be weird or creepy, but just for a moment, when I count to three, I want, I want everybody to close your eyes just for a second. And I'm going to count to three, and when I, count, when I get to three, I want you to picture, I want you to picture a pathway. Don't try to, just when I count to three, picture a pathway. One, two, three. 
What did you see? Or you can open your eyes and look up here. You know, I want to challenge you tonight. I believe whatever image you saw of a pathway, that is, in fact, the pathway of your life. And some of you, it may have been a, a, a cobblestone pathway through a forest with a trickling brook next to it. Some of you, it may have been uh, something near the beach. Some of you may have been near, near water. Some of you may have been in a real dry place. I don't know. But I believe whatever image that popped into your head when I said one, two, three, is, is representative of your life and your journey. And before we get into anything else, I want to share a little bit about my journey with you all tonight. So we, I got a picture of my family here. That's us. And um, that's, this is, yeah, you can clap. Somebody clapped. I appreciate that. Aren't they pretty? Mm. Um, this, this, on the end, the reason I'm doing this is because I, my, my, I'm living here in McKinney with one of our daughters and my wife and, the, and, the rest of, and our other two kids are still in Florida so that they can finish school before they move out here. And then our oldest daughter is, is a, uh, a student at TCU. But the girl on the end down here standing there, that's Paige. She's 18 years old. Peyton is our 20-year-old daughter. She's next to her. The handsome guy in the middle, yours truly. That's our son there. His name is Parker. I'm a holding Parker. My wife is Tyree. She's right there. And the next to her is Paxton, who's 16. And um, she's, she's living here with me and McKinney and is a junior at McKinney Christian Academy. And um, pa um, Peyton and Paxton are both here tonight. And so I just want to, will you guys wave, say hi. <clears throat> I'm so proud of my family and um, thankful for them. I don't know what just hit me, but there's Dusty in here or something. <laughs> Lots of allergies. I know some other people's allergies are flaring up too. Well, hey, I was born in Graham, Texas. Many of you, anybody heard of Graham, Texas before? Show hands. All right, several people. It's about 90 miles due west of here. You hit 380, you just keep going, basically, it'll get you to Graham. I graduated from Graham High School in 1994, went down to Waco, attended Baylor University, graduated from Baylor in 1998 with a degree in political science. From Baylor, got hired um, with the state police, with the um, Texas Department of Public Safety, was down in Austin going through their uh, trooper school, and had also applied with the um, Arlington, Texas Police Department. And uh, while I was there at, at DPS, I get a call from Arlington. They had an academy class starting, so I started with the Arlington Police Department in January of 1999. I was a, I was a cop, police officer there for several years, um, ended up making detective, worked undercover for about three years, and then uh, applied uh, with the um, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS. I don't know if anybody's seen that, uh, have watched that TV show, it's pretty popular. Um, but that's a real law enforcement agency, just like, you know, the TV show. Some people don't realize it's a, it's a real deal. So I got hired. I was a special agent with NCIS. That's what moved us out to Florida. So we, were, we moved out to Florida to the Jacksonville area. And I was traveling a ton. I was traveling to Central and South America a lot. Got to do some really cool things that, that I never imagined that I would be able to do, um, working for the government and, and being a special agent and, and things like that. While we were there in Jacksonville, as Pastor Jeff mentioned, we started attending a church called Celebration Church in July of 2007. And um, that really radically kind of changed our life. Up to that point in my life, I had been able to just to pretty much achieve kind of what I wanted to in my own strengths and abilities and talents. Had been kind of blessed, got lucky a few times, and uh, pretty much got every job I kind of applied for. And um, things were just working out for us pretty well. And I had never really been a student of the Bible. I grew up in a Christian home. But I, I, I played what Pastor Jeff calls Bible roulette. That, that, was, that was the majority of my time in the Word was Bible roulette. I would be like, man, something's going on, God. Show me something on this page. 
No, okay, show me something on this page. Any of you ever do that? That was the extent. I got this Bible when I graduated high school in 1994. And I kept it on my nightstand. After we got married, we had our kids, I kept this Bible on my nightstand so that if anybody came into my house, into our home, they would see it. But what they didn't know is that it would get so dusty, I'd have to dust it off pretty regularly. Because while I had it sitting on my nightstand, I never had it in my hand. It was real, it looked good. So then we get to celebration, and they kept talking about reading the Bible and how important it was to, to be in the Word and, and to have, they called it quiet time. You know, different people call it different things each day and, and to, to read Scripture. And they kept talking about it, and there were some people in the church that I liked and looked up to. And I thought, you know what, I, I, I kind of like these guys. You know, they're, they're living a life that I wouldn't mind living, doing some things. They, they, you know, they're... So I'm going to give this a shot. So I started reading the Bible every day. I got a Bible in a year. I printed off this Bible in a year reading plan. And, um, and, I, and I started reading it, and I did that. And um, throughout that process, man, God started to work in my heart and in our family that's led us here today. I decided to take the Bible seriously. We also had a series on fasting. And man, I thought, the only people that fast are weirdos. I thought people who fasted, like you had to wear sackcloth and ashes and shave your head. I, did, I had no concept of what like, New Testament biblical fasting was. And I, I literally had a conversation with my wife. We said, listen, we're going to continue to go to this church, even though they're weird now, but we are not going to fast. <laughs> but sure enough, God started kind of messing with me, and I went to the bookstore. This is back in bookstore days. And Jensen Franklin had a book called Fasting. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to get this and read it. This is a true story. I got that book, and I was so concerned about what it would look like, me buying a book on fasting. This is the stronghold that, that I had in my head. I was so concerned about what it would look like. I bought two other books, so when I went to check out, it wasn't the only one up there, and I stuck it on the bottom. I was so concerned that the person checking out was going to look and be like, <laughs> one of those. But they didn't. And I read the book and, and I, I, I finished the book. And one day I remember I walked into the kitchen and I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm going to do a three-day fast. And she said, that's great. I'm not. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to try this. And, uh, and this may not be true, but it's my story. I'm going to tell it. She looked at me and said, now you're becoming one of those weirdos. But I did a, I did a three-day fast. And on the last day of that fast, we were I had to be down in Fort Lauderdale. We were doing an operation down there, and I was traveling with some friends of mine. And again, man, I had hangups. I was like, man, I don't want these guys to know I'm fasting. They're going to think I'm weird, but, you know, we were going out to eat with the local PD, and we were doing a lot of things. I was like, I don't know how this is going to play out, but, you know, I'm going to stick with it. And, and I don't remember what happened, but I ended up finishing that fast. And about that same time, I, uh, I was, I was in, at the Doubletree Hotel, down in, in Fort Lauderdale, and um, God just started messing with me about giving. And we were the type of people at the time that, you know, when we had a little extra, we'd give a little bit. But I didn't understand stewardship. I didn't understand the tithe. I didn't, I, there was a lot I didn't know, and God started messing with me. I got out a piece of paper, and I started, I wrote out income, this, this, bills. And, man, on paper, it looked like we had enough to give, to tithe, 10%. So I called my wife, and I said, we're going to start tithing. And she said, we can't afford that. And I said, we've got to be able to. It, it, it just makes sense. It makes sense on paper. What are we doing with our money? So we began to tithe, and we moved forward in faith, and somehow it worked out. We began to lead a group at Celebration, and it grew, and we had a, we had a great time leading a small group. And develop some great friendships that, that last to this day. And after a, after a while of serving, I had to, listen, I had to force my way onto a serving team. I, I saw some guys, they were standing around ushering. 
And I thought, you know, I, I, I kind of want to do that. I want to be an usher. I'm a cop and, you know, whatever, and I carry a gun all the time, and, man, maybe they could use me. Turned in this serving application, nothing. Turned in another one, nothing. And I was like, man, I guess they don't want me. So, but I really wanted to do it, so I asked somebody, hey, where do the ushers meet? And they told me. I just showed up one day. <laughs> they were like, what are you doing? I said, I'm here to serve. They said, did you do an application? I said, two. I filled out two, and I hadn't heard anything. I said, well, come on, you can, you can start serving. So I, I, I began serving and then became a lead usher and then started a security team and just did all that. And after a couple of years, Celebration came to me, and they said, hey, we'd like to hire you. You want to come on staff? And at the time, if you know anything about federal service, I was a, I was a GS-13-1, and I was making an additional 25% on top of your base pay and locality and all this. So I was making, I was making good money, and my wife was a public school teacher. And, um, and so Celebration said, hey, we'd love to hire you. And again, I would go to Tyree, and I said, hey, I, I think, man, I'm supposed to, to leave law enforcement, go to work at a church. And she said, let's pray about it, and we did. And felt like that was the right move. But again, in both of our minds, we were like, there's no way. I don't know if you know church budgets and things like that, but they, they can't compete with the federal government. And so I thought, man, I don't, I don't know, you know how this is going to work out for us, but we're going to step out in obedience and faith. And we did, and it worked. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because everyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That means something. Faith is important. In Romans chapter 6, Paul writes about obedience. And he describes how obedience leads to righteousness. But he doesn't stop there. He says that righteousness leads to holiness, and it's holiness that leads to eternal life. So to get to eternal life, it starts with obedience. That just was profound to me years ago when I read it, and I was like, God, I want to lead an obedient, faith-filled life. And it is not easy. I call it living a life disrupted. Because if something was easy, it doesn't require much obedience. That's simple compliance. Obedience requires a sacrifice. Obedience requires some effort. And it begins with faith. So some of us need a faith infusion to actually move us along on your journey. So tonight, I'm going to give you three simple steps. Three simple steps to, uh, to, to receive a faith infusion. How many of you want a faith infusion? All right, like three. Good. We're in the church. Now, this stuff is deep. Okay? And now, Pastor Jeff, how, like Pastor Jeff gets deep, right? I mean, he's breaking out some Greek occasionally. He goes deep into Scripture. I went, I, I went Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Spanish. I went deep, deep into some of these, into some of this theology. So I hope you guys are prepared to receive it because it's deep. It's deep. You want a faith infusion. Here's the number one point. Get up. I looked that word up in the Greek, it means get up. <laughs> Let's look back at, at the story in, in Acts chapter 9. As he neared Damascus on his journey, right? We're talking about journeys, pathways. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. This is the best two sentences here. I am Jesus. He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, as if he needed some confirmation. Now get up. 
Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. He didn't tell him what to do on the ground. He said, get up and go, and then you'll find out what you must do. Again, another time in, in John chapter 5, Jesus is, is, is in Jerusalem, and there was a, uh, a pool that would, they would stir the waters and try to get people down. You all are familiar with the story. People believed if they could get into the waters, they could be healed. And Jesus was passing by one day, and he looked down, and he sees a man laying on a mat. And in verse 8, it picks up and says, Then Jesus said to him, what? Everybody say it. Get up. Say it again. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. How many of you know Jesus could have healed him right there on the mat? He's Jesus. But there was something symbolic, there was some action needed to spur the faith of the healing that was coming. And it wasn't recite this. It wasn't be more religious. It wasn't go to church more. It, it, it was a simple two words. Get up. Get up. Many of us are living our lives knocked down. Life is hard. Relationships are hard. Financial issues can knock us down. Health issues. Come on, man. How many of you know that staying healthy is hard to do? And when we start having health issues, it's easy to get knocked down. Career issues, professional issues will knock us down. Man, in this season, November 3rd cannot get here soon enough. Politics and the affairs of the world can knock us down. Some of you need to quit watching the news and news feeds and, and all this, man, and just spend time with God or just turn it off. We, I get one vote, you get one vote, I can guarantee you I ain't going to change your mind and you're not changing mine. Can we give it a break? We have responsibility as believers, but it can't consume us. God's not ring like, oh, I wonder who's going to win. I sure hope it's so-and-so. Because then if, I think some of us think that. Or we're living our lives like that. Some of us, man, we become the master of the flop. Anybody know what the flop is? Anybody watch the NBA? Anybody watch men's soccer? Listen, women's soccer doesn't happen. Peyton, Peyton, our, our oldest there, the 20-year-old, she, she's a student athlete at TCU. She plays soccer. She's in her junior year. And it's just is an incredible, incredible athlete and always has been. Girls' soccer, they don't do it. But come on, if you watch a men's soccer game, you see the flop. Now the NBA's doing the flop. Some of us are living life, man, just flopping everywhere. Bump up against the little adversity. Oh, foul. Have a difficult decision to make. Oh, flop. Foul. We've mastered the flop. In Joshua chapter 7, the Lord is speaking to Joshua. He says, but the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. Why have you fallen on your face? That's a question I believe he's asking us tonight. And I'm not discrediting or minimizing the circumstances in your life. I know people are going through difficult things, painful things. Things that you, would you wouldn't even wish on your worst enemy. And they were beyond your control. You had, like, you did everything right and you still had this happen, this circumstance still crushed you, this, this circumstance still knocked you to the ground. But I believe the Lord called me here tonight to tell you it's time to stand up. 
You've been down long enough. The lesson isn't down there anymore. The lesson is to stand. It's time to stand up. We can't control our environment. We can't control the scenarios that that occur to us in our life. But we 1,000%, 1,000% can control and we choose our attitudes. And we also get to choose where we're standing. That's a reality some of us don't want to face. Because we're not standing somewhere good right now. And it's easy to blame someone else. But can I just be real? And the, because I've done this. We can't control what other people do to us, but we can't control our attitude towards them. We can't control our attitude towards the situation. The Bible says, greater is he who is in me than what? He who is in the world. When we walk around with our heads down, defeated, feeling hopeless, feeling dejected and sad. It's okay for a season to do that. But when we believe that's our final destination, when we believe we're, we're, we're in bondage and captivity to brokenness or shame or to a posture of being on the ground... Listen, man, hear my heart. I'm not trying to be mean. But when we stay stuck in that, I believe what you're telling Jesus is what you did on the cross isn't enough. What you did when you took all the shame, all the guilt, all brokenness, even death, and you overcame it on the cross... That was awesome, God, but it's not enough for me in this situation. You don't understand. Many of us are believing that lie. And we're communicating that through our actions. Y'all ready for point number two? It's deep. I don't know if you can handle it. Point number two. Grab a friend. Never thought of it, did you? You're like, dude, man, come on. Give us some real meat that you want. I, this is meaty. <laughs> Many of us need to hear this. Here's the thing. Most everybody, I'm not giving you some great revelation tonight. Some deep digging out of the scripture. But I am trying to give you something practical that can make a difference in your life yeah. that you need to hear. Yeah. I didn't choose to, like, this is what God laid on my heart to share. Grab a friend. Let's look at Acts chapter 9 again. The men traveling with, everybody say traveling with. Traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. Step one. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they, everybody look at this. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and he did not eat Or drink anything. There was some intimacy there with these people. And what I love about this story is a lot of things. But one thing is, it doesn't say if some people ran, does it? We don't know. It just says the men traveling with them stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anything. When he got up, they led him by the hand. I wonder if any of them fled. And you remember a while ago I told you I was a special agent with NCIS and, and with that comes certain, uh, you have to get a, obtain a top secret security clearance and then maintain it throughout your whole time and then there's different programs you can get read in above that if, if you're familiar with any of the uh, uh, clearance levels with, within the government, there's S- sensitive compartmental information, all this. Anyways, so as the NCIS agent you have to uh, get a, a, and maintain a top secret security clearance and And so through that, I had access to some secret files that no one knows about. And listen, don't tell anybody, but I took some things from there. And there's a secret government database that has really, really old pictures that nobody knows exist. 
But I actually researched that database and I found some images of the people who were with Saul during his encounter. Look, here, here's the first one. Look at that. Turning their heads away. I, I love these pictures. Because they just, they're raw fear. What this was, was there was a haunted house. How many, you know, you ride the roller coasters and they take pictures going down hills and, and all that. They kept, this was a haunted house. And at a moment of, Rah! or whatever they did, they, they snapped pictures of people. So these are real reactions to being startled or to being afraid. And I, I just love them. I, I got a couple more. <laughs> But look at this, like they're turning their faces away. But look in every one of these pictures, you're going to see people doing something. They're grabbing hold of who's closest to them. Go to the next picture. <laughs> that one cat said, I'm out of here. And somebody said, no, you're not. <laughs> Determined. Look at that. Man, he's even got a, like, I mean, something's happening. This next guy, hang on, don't go to the next picture yet, but this next guy is one of my favorites because, man, he's, he's bro's intense. Go ahead, go to the next picture. <laughs> man, look how big her eyes are. But, but what I love about this is if you just, just kind of just a first glimpse, you're like, man, that guy's got ice water in his veins. But then, look, everybody has a... Look at his hand here. <laughs> That's something you do like... He probably did that as a kid when he got nervous or afraid. So those pictures are funny. I, I, I saw that. I came across it. I didn't really take anything from any database, Clearly. But what I love in every one of those pictures, there was, there were, they, everybody responded with wanting to grab hold. They wanted something to grab a hold to. So my question for you is who do you have to grab? Is there even anybody in your life close enough to take you by the hand? Or have you done such a great job isolating yourself that people are afraid to almost even talk to you. And you like it like that. And it may feel bold, but in many ways it's broken. You know, when God created Adam in the garden, he said, what, it's not good for man to be alone. There's something inside of each of us and all of us that first wants a relationship with the Father. But then he uniquely created and wired us to be in relationship with others. Pastor James Brown here, he says, I think he says, relationships are the currency of heaven. I like that. Sometimes we need other people to help us. Contrast what happened in, in, in Saul's situation, Paul, Saul. Contrast what happened in Acts chapter 9 to this story in Acts chapter 13. It's not going to be up on the screen. But in Acts chapter 13, this proconsul, this ruler of an area that Paul had, had rolled into with his buddy Barnabas, started hearing about them and some of the works and things that they were doing. And there was this sorcerer named Bar-Jesus who was kind of, he was in with the proconsul. And the proconsul said, hey, bring, bring Paul and, and Barnabas to me, and then I'm going to bring my guy, and let's see what happens. So they, sh they show up, and Paul just looks right at this sorcerer, and he says, now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Paul could relate to that, right? After his encounter, what it said, he was blind for three days. Immediately, mist and darkness came over Bar-Jesus, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. There's a big difference, right? Can't you see that? We all know what it looks to like, just grope about. And when you're blind, what's the, do you walk? It's dangerous, right? What do you want to do? You, you get down low on your hands and knees. 
That's what groping is. It says he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand, and no one did. Because they saw the power of Christ at work. And they said, I don't want anything to do with that. Some of you need to take the walls down. And I know it's hard. It's vulnerable. There's, there's all kinds of things that go into it. But by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, it is possible in your life. One, one easy way is here at the church, you could get involved with the team. I mean, we no perfect people here. But we need, we need people serving, being part of the teams. That's how, that's how I started. It was, I just saw some guys ushering, and I thought, I want to be an usher. Maybe when you're walking in, you see the people greeting. Can you smile? Can you say hi to somebody? We don't do blood. Like, we're not doing some blood ritual with you or anything. Like, just being part of a team, you come and you get to serve. You get to make friends. So I want to encourage you, if you're not serving right now, this is a great time to get connected to a team. There in your, in your seats, Pastor Jeff talked about the connection card. I want to encourage you, just fill out a connection card. All you got to do is put your name and email. And then on the bottom here, just write, serve. Just put your name and email, write, serve. Put it in the boxes at the back, in the lobby. And I will contact you this week and get you connected on a team. And that may be the very first step that you need to get up. The first step is get up. The second is grab a friend. The band can start coming up. Before I get to my third point, I hope you hear my heart. I'm not trying to be hard or incompassionate, non-compassionate, whatever. I'm trying to be compassionate. And I'm trying to speak some truth that I feel like the Lord wanted me to share tonight with you to help you grow closer to Him. There's no condemnation. And we've all been in tough spots. We've all been in difficult situations. But tonight may be the opportunity for you to get up, grab a friend, and then my third point is move forward. You see again in Acts 9, I keep going back to it. Jesus told Paul, Saul, get up and go into the city. Then you will find out what you must do. Jesus told the, the invalid, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. This guy had been laying there 38 years. He'd been there 38 years. And he had one encounter with the risen Savior of the world. He, had, he wasn't risen yet, but we know that's who he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This invalid had one encounter with Jesus. And after 38 years, he got up, he took his mat, and he left. Some of you have been on your mat for way too long. Maybe it's been a few hours. Or maybe it's been a few years. But as, as I was preparing this and just praying for all of you, I prayed for every heart that was going to be in the room tonight. I just saw this image. Of people standing with concrete on their feet. Your feet are encased in concrete that you yourself poured. I mean, you're just like, I, I can't move this. And if I was to come along and try to give you a hand, it'd be like dropping you into a, into a lake. You would just sink to the bottom. 
because it's your honor and it's your God's gift to you to break your own concrete off your feet. Pastor Jeff, like we could try to bring a sledgehammer, but I'm telling you, we may could put a crack in it. But until we make the decision that I'm done with this concrete, there's still going to be some concrete dust. There's still going to be some remnant. There's still going to be a reminder there to us. Something else that I felt the Lord just laid on my heart. And I think maybe this was just for me, but I'm going to share it with you guys and just be real transparent with you. Some of us view our stubbornness to move forward as an attribute. We think, nah, man, I'm not going anywhere. I'm standing strong right where I'm at. We think that's an attribute. But really, it's fear. It's really fear that's keeping us from moving forward. Life is passing us by. Specifically, here's what, here's what I just felt the Lord lay on my heart. He said, He said, there's going to be people who have been bridled by a spirit of stubbornness. You know what a bridle, you know what a bridle does to a horse? A halter goes on the horse. You can just lead them around, kind of tie them up. But until you get a bridle on the horse, you don't control them. And I felt like the Lord said, there are people who have been bridled by a spirit of stubbornness that's just controlling every decision we make. Every path, every direction, everywhere we look, it's not up to us, it's that, that's that spirit of stubbornness. We're just, it's yanking this way, so we go over there. It's yanking back, we go over here. It's, it's stopping, we stop. Tonight's tonight. Tonight is the night to break that spirit. Take a look around. Are you by yourself? Has life passed you by? It's not too late. Man, God can do and restore in an instant what it's taken a lifetime to lose. You're not behind. You're not too late. Tonight, you are right on time. To break that bridle. It's time to get up. It's time to go. And there's three different ways that you can move forward. One is casually. I'll just kind of get there when I get there. There's no urgency to anything that you do. Probably not much wrong with living life that way. But there's just no purpose in it. It's an attitude of, well, if they need something, they'll ask. I'm asking tonight. Will you get up? Will you grab a friend? We're here as a church. Grab us. It's time to move forward. Another way that you can move through life is distracted. Or you're more worried about what other people are doing than you're worried about what you yourself are doing. Every little thing you see is a distraction. Every story you read about is a distraction. Every tweet, every snap is a distraction. And we're almost worshiping at the, at the idol of so many distractions in our lives where, and guys, God is still on the throne. He's not pondering his plans. I don't want to waste a minute of anxiety and worry about something that man, God already knows. I want to be laser focused. Pastor Jeff, I don't know if he says, I haven't heard him say in a long time. You know what he used to say all the time? White hot. He used to, you still say that? He said, I want to be white hot about something. 
Man, I want us as a church to be white hot about Jesus, about compassion, about mercy, about loving people who are different than us. Man, if we can't do that, we got a ways to go. God loves all of us and all of them, whoever them may be to you. And we putting up walls and boundaries. I'm not talking about immigration stuff. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the laws of our country. I'm talking about our spiritual attitudes. Y'all reckon, do you see the difference? I'm not talking about being a lawbreaker. I'm talking about being a Jesus follower. Hebrew says, obey your leaders and submit to their authorities. I'm not talking about breaking laws. I'm talking about the posture of your heart. Can you not love somebody different or doing something different than you? <laughs> Jesus told the lady at the well, man, how many wives have you, or husbands have you had? She said, you know all my business. He was surrounded by a bunch of other pharisaical people who wanted to cast stones and, and, and punish somebody. And Jesus, pastor, spoke on this a few weeks ago. He started riding and he just started speaking and people just started leaving. He said, he who is out of sin, let them cast the first stone. Man, guys, we need to be careful that we're not sliding down a slippery slope of the idols of our government, of our financial institutions, that stuff is going to, man, it's, we need to be, act, we, we're called to action in those areas. But I'm not wanting to live a life dependent upon the outcome of those things. I want to be kingdom minded. The third way that we can move, we move casually, we can move distracted. The third way is with purpose. We move with purpose. That means we go fast when we need to. We go slow when we need to. We can stop for a while if we need to. But we know we're on mission. Maybe some of us need to be reminded of that tonight. That you are on mission. We are, C.S. Lewis says, we're waging a war behind enemy lines. We're, he says we're waging a war of sabotage behind enemy lines. I love that language. That's just, that's just me. But I love, man, I'm waging a war, a sabotage, fighting behind the enemy lines in this earthly world while we're serving a heavenly king. Sign me up. Your assignment isn't over. Your retirement hasn't begun. This isn't a season of idol worship at the altar of everything else that the world is throwing and trying to distract us because I'm telling you church that's what's happening we are the enemy is still trying to distract us but man as a church let's stay white hot laser focused on Jesus and the cross and his victory and his overcoming and his grace and his mercy and his love Paul got that Paul understood that and Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 come on many of you know this by heart Paul says brothers I do not consider that I have made it my own but one thing I do this was a daily thing one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead come on man getting up grabbing a friend moving forward it, it's straining Paul says, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Get up. Grab a friend. Move forward. It's time to activate. This is the season, church. Man, if the church, if the world ever needed the church, whew, I know every generation probably says that, right? I feel it, do you? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that Anchor Church 
Well, in fact, that the church of the world would begin to rise up, that you would begin to, to stir a holiness within us. That would be transformational, not only in our own lives, but in our lives, or in, in the life of the, in the entire world, God. Stir up a passion within us to be difference makers, to be influencers, to be world changers. Stir up a passion within us where we wouldn't be content in being knocked down on the ground anymore, no matter the circumstances, no matter the death, no matter the divorce, no matter, no matter the bankruptcy, no matter the disease. I don't care what disease, what name is on that disease. In Jesus' name, stand up. 